And the title of the message uh, this afternoon is The Lake of Fire. Uh, we would call it, we would typically just say hell, you know, is whenever we think of that. And, and hell is one of those topics that, you know, is overlooked a lot of times. One, because it's not popular. Uh, another just seems like not a good thing to talk about. We certainly don't want to talk about that. Uh, I would say one thing even is just kind of some of it, it's confusing about what hell is and the, and the purpose. And really, in my head, it's just hard to fathom eternal punishment. And I think that others kind of feel the same way. So unfortunately, a lot of people today, a lot of preachers have even like dumbed it down or, or watered it down to where hell doesn't even seem that bad. And uh, look, that's not the reality of it. Obviously, uh, when you're talking about the Bible, you go through things and you have to preach the truth about what it really says. And uh, you know, sometimes it's, it's hard to do that. I praise the Lord that, um, you know, I was just thinking about this, uh, about this. Topic. Everybody in this congregation probably used to this topic. So, I mean, we preach it all the time when we're at doors and, and what have you. But uh, but I was thinking about, like, having kids here. I know this feels kind of awkward not to have uh, the kids here today, but uh, young kids, and when we bring them all together in the auditorium, sometimes we talk about things, and it got in my mind like the other day. Uh, I don't know when it was, but I was preaching about like cannibalism and stuff like that, and and people eating their their womb, and and this was right straight out of the Bible, and and it just like dawned on me like later on, I was like, man, that was so gruesome. Like I actually said that in front of kids. But praise the Lord, I think the every philosophy here is. Uh, you know, our kids, the world a lot of times will say, Independent Baptist Church, you know, hey, your kids are so sheltered and everything. And obviously we shelter them in the sense of trying to protect them from some of the evils of the world. But what I appreciate is that our kids grow, grew up, or most in here probably have grown up, I know mine did, sheltered from, in one sense, about things that they weren't able to do or, or whatever. And some people don't world in the world don't understand that or whatever. But one thing they weren't sheltered from was the truth. Right? For instance, I could pretend like there's not wicked people out there. I could pretend that and keep my kids sheltered from that. That's not going to do them any good. Right? They have to know that the wickedness is out there, uh, but they need to turn to God. And the reality is what we teach them is when we're teaching them from the Word of God is the truth of how vile these things are, for instance. Talking about drugs, alcohol, stuff like that, you're going to talk about how... It harms people, what it does to lives. Uh, in the ministry, they're going to see how it's affected people. Uh, when we knock on doors, they're going to look at people. They're going to see the lifestyle and the house and everything, and they're going to know how these things affect them. They're not sheltered from all that. They just know the truth of it. So the world's idea of sheltering is like, hey, just make everything seem so innocent. Uh, you know, the world likes to lie to kids and teach them about Santa Claus and teach them all these kinds of things, right? That's not hurt helping them at all. What we need to do is be truthful with them. And that's just kind of how we should approach studying the Bible all together. So I, I don't know, like I said, I don't think hell is that sensitive of a topic. And here we understand the reality of it. But it is true that from time to time you'll come across people who just don't want to talk about that. I don't think that's an appropriate topic. How many times have you heard that when you knock on someone's door? I, don't, I just don't think this is an appropriate topic. And I'm like, it's very appropriate. <laughs> you know, it's, a, it's a, your eternal soul that we're talking about. So this is actually, if you think about it, one of the scariest, it's got to be, if you really narrow it down, the scariest thing in the Bible is the fact that there's an eternal hell, uh, and, and, and that is a torment and a punishment. We're going to talk about that a little bit uh, this afternoon. Now, some have tried to because of, of, the, of it being uncomfortable. Uh, you know, I've met people that even weren't allowed to say hell in their house because it was a cuss word. It doesn't matter what the context was. They weren't allowed to say that. And, uh, and I thought, well, that just seems really strange. I mean, this is a real place, just like heaven is, you know. But some have tried to make jokes out of it. You think about the cartoons, you know, and they've got like these cute little demons with pitchforks and, and, uh, and all, and they just make it seem like it's not really that big of a deal. Some have tried to say... Uh, uh, sometimes at the door you'll hear this. You'll talk to somebody about heaven and hell, and they'll say, "Well, I just think hell's on earth. I just think this is this is hell. We're living in hell." Well, I can understand why you might think that sometimes, but it's going to get a lot worse <laughs> than this. Okay, and so you know, one person has said, I don't know who came up with this, but uh, somebody said, uh, uh, "The earth is as close 
to hell as believers will ever get. But earth is also as close to heaven as unbelievers will ever get. And so uh, that just kind of tells you the reality of our, our life, which is just as a vapor on this earth. And uh, I teach the kids, like I said, never to talk about it or whatever, but hell's a serious reality, and it's something that needs to be talked about. Uh, it gets easy to avoid it in the pulpit. And so this is a good opportunity, I think, to, to talk about it because what this chapter mentions at the end of, the, of, of chapter 19 and then going into chapter 20 is the final destination of those who are in hell, uh, be, and, and they end up going into what's called the lake of fire, and I'll explain the difference uh, the, the, uh, of what all that has to do with. But first of all, let me talk about the origin of hell. Origin of hell. Turn to Matthew 25. The Bible actually has a whole lot to say about hell. Uh, some details are left out. We don't know exactly, uh, but we know enough about the origin based on verses like this, chapter 25, verse 41, says, Then shall he say unto, also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire. And then here's the part I want you to notice. Prepared for the devil and his angels. Okay, so there's this idea that when God created hell and hell fire, this was a place created for the devil created for the fallen angels and this is going to be their eternal fate their eternal punishment okay never intended necessarily for humans to go there except the fact that those who would reject christ you know they're going to suffer that same fate and so the origin is that god created it for uh for the devil and his angels now, the word hell, this is, confuses people sometimes because uh, a lot of our English words have pagan roots, and this confuses a lot of people, and they don't want to use certain words, or they say if you talk about something that, hey, that's, that's pagan or whatever. The, the origin of the word hell was pagan. If you look that up, the origin of the word hell is pagan. Well, that's only because the English language wasn't around in the days of the Bible, okay? Not as we know it today. And so when we read the King James Bible, it's written in, Eng in English, you know, similar words that would have been in the 1500s, and then obviously in the 1600s, uh, the King James Bible was written. Uh, it's using words that were commonly spoken at that time, and by that time, hell, you know, meant the place that the Bible Okay, because people are going to say, oh, no, no, there's Sheol, and there's Hades. And they're going to throw all these names out at you. But look, we can read the Bible, and when it says hell, we don't really have to have a Greek course or a Hebrew course. right? That's the word that we use. It doesn't matter what the origin is. That's our English word that we use. Okay, uh, And so sometimes uh, people will say that hell, <laughs> this is kind of a joke people say sometimes. Some people say hell doesn't mean hell. And that's true. It's true. Some people will say, no, 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 no. What's talking about right there is the grave. Or here's another thing they'll say, the abode of the dead. Well, I'm thinking, well, where's what's the abode of the dead? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's hell, right? Uh, no, 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 it's just this place. I remember we had a, uh, uh, we were hitting a Swahili community there in what we call Little Congo. And how many times we were able to let somebody listen to a presentation of the gospel in Swahili. And they listened to it. Some souls got, some people got saved. And uh, later on, I said, you know what? I, I know some people that speak Swahili, missionaries and stuff like that. And so on Facebook, I just put a feeler out there. Will somebody listen to this and tell me what they think about the gospel presentation? <laughs> and so a guy answered me who was a professor uh, out of the Bible college I went to who used to be in Kenya, who speaks Swahili. And he listened to it and said, yeah, that's great. He said, it's just exactly, you know, really pretty much like what I would, uh, how I would preach. He said, the only one problem in there." is there's a part in there where he says that Jesus went to hell for three days. And he says he used the word that means hell. <laughs> that was basically what he said. And I was like, okay, I mean, that not that what the, our King James Bible says, hell, in, in multiple places, but it, it, says, it says hell. And he says, yeah, 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 but we would use a word that means like the boat of the dead or the, the nether word or the afterlife or something like that. And I'm thinking, well, what happens to somebody when they die? Their soul either goes to heaven or it goes to hell, right? 
And so I'm kind of confused, like, what the catch is, but people want to divide this all up, say, multiple words in the Greek and multiple words in the Hebrew, you know, that it, it means all these different things. Well, the problem with saying that hell is referring to the grave is a lot of times that's not consistent in the Bible, and that's really uh, confusing. And so let me give you an example here. And by the way, the King James translators, they, they had the word grave. The word grave was something that was used in the Bible. What about this uh, famous verse, 1 Corinthians 15, 55 says, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? All right, Jesus rose from the grave. It didn't say he rose from hell, right? Uh, so I'm going to explain that, try to explain that. Uh, go to Psalm 63. Psalm 63. Here's an interesting verse. Look at uh, starting in verse 9. Psalm 63, verse 9. But those that, by the way, David, David, and a lot of these Psalms, you know, he talks about his enemies that hate God, and he's like, hey, God is just going you know, to send them to hell, right? And he, and he we would call them imprecatory prayers sometimes that it, where he, he speaks these kinds of things, harsh words. And here's what he says in if, uh, uh, verse 60, I mean, verse 9 and 10 of, of Psalm 63. But those that seek my soul to destroy it shall go into the lower parts of the earth. Now, First of all, is the grave the lower parts of the earth? I mean, the, the grave's not typically that deep, right? Nowadays, we think about six feet. I mean, back then, tombs, maybe they went down a little further. I don't know. Uh, but, you know, down the lower parts of the earth makes me think like way down, the center of the earth or something like that. And here's what he said. They shall fall by the sword. They shall be a portion for foxes. Now, if they're... If I understand that right, if they're eaten by foxes, if their bodies are apportioned for foxes, how are they going to be in the grave? Well, they're not. You see, their body is might be in the grave, or their body might be in the sea, or their body might be eaten by animals, or body might be burned alive, or whatever, but their soul is going to hell, is what he's talking about, the lower part of the earth. Okay, so uh, another example is Jesus himself. Look at Matthew 16. Or, uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, uh, Psalm 16. We'll go to Matthew in a second. Psalm 16. Now, later in the Bible, this is uh, this verse is referenced. And so we know that this is, is uh, uh, prophetic about Jesus, and it's quoted again in Acts. But in chapter 16, verse 10, it says, for thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Okay, now you could say, all right, see, you didn't leave my soul in hell, you know, where it was going to be corrupted or whatever, and that he's talking about hell the whole time. That it wasn't left in hell, it didn't see corruption or whatever. But the thing is, Jesus' body, Right, so the Holy One did, didn't see corruption because it was just in the tomb for three days, and then He rose again, right, given a glorified body. However, what happened to the soul? His soul, the Bible clearly says, went to hell. Now, some people will want to say, well, what hell like, you know, paradise or in the middle of? There's different reasons why they came up with these different uh, uh, theories about where He went, but the Bible just says hell. Okay, and so I think uh, there's no reason to make more out of that than is there. All right, uh, so now let's go to Matthew 12. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 40. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly... So shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now, somebody might say, well, see, just like Jonah was in the belly of a whale, Jesus was in the tomb for three days and three nights. But wait a minute, the heart of the earth? The heart of the earth doesn't sound like, 
you know, just inside a tomb or something. You know, I think it's specifically talking about how his soul uh, went to hell. And again, the details aren't super important right now for what happened there or how it happened. That's not the point. The point is, what does the Bible say? Okay. And, uh, and obviously, when you know that Jesus conquered hell and death and the grave and all of that stuff, and he conquered that physically and spiritually. His soul didn't, uh, didn't perish. His body didn't perish because he was God and he's perfect, right? But he had a purpose for fulfilling all that to take our place, all right? So here, uh, uh, so the number one, we talked a little bit about the origin of hell. Now let's talk about the nature of hell, okay? What do we mean when we say hell? Well, the Bible almost always I would say always, but I can't, I, I can't think about all the verses in the Bible in my head right now, but almost always when the word hell is used, it's associated with fire, right? So look at Revelation again, our, our text, Revelation 19. And in verse 20, it says, And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast. This is what we've been talking about throughout the last few uh, chapters of the series. And then that worshipped his image. These both, talking about the beast and the false prophet, these both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. Now what is this place, this lake of fire burning with brimstone? Uh, now, brimstone, I don't ex understand the exact composition, but people have said it's like a, it's a sulfur, sulfuric type thing. I don't, I don't know. Uh, this is something that's associated a lot of times. Fire from heaven will come down like brimstone, or hell is like brimstone. This is just the way that God uh, made it. Now, there are some questions that come into place when we talk about hell being fire. One of the things I've always questioned myself is, does the soul feel fire? Well, obviously it does, because the Bible talks about that. Uh, now, you're saying, well, there's the spiritual world, and then there's the physical world. I understand that, and I don't understand where the two meet. Uh, I mean, whenever demons walked on the earth and possessed people, they literally were cast out of a man and, and put into pigs. I mean, I don't understand how all this works, but I know that there's some sort of suffering that they're going to take place, and it has to do with fire. Now, obviously they don't die they continue to suffer this eternally. And so it's not like their bodies that are suffering that torment, their souls, whatever body that has, is, is actually feeling the flame in the same way that or else it would perish, right? But somehow God has allowed them to uh, stay alive through that. And that sounds like terrible, cruel, and unusual punishment, okay? But number one, it doesn't matter. This, that's God's prerogative, you know? I've never understood people that say, well, I don't believe in God because the God of the Bible, you know, if he is true, uh, he's, a, he's an evil God, which he's not. But look, would that matter anyway? <laughs> if he's a true God, you need to fear him and you need to, you need to think about the fact that he has the power to, to cast both soul and uh, body into the flame. Okay, And so uh, here's the nature of it. It's fire. Mark 9, 44, I'll just read it to you. It says uh, where there, or actually, it says it three times in Mark 9, 44, 46, and 48. It says, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. All right? And it's a terrible thought. I understand it's not pleasant, but that's what the Bible talks about. Matthew 18, 9 says, and if thine eye offend thee, cluck it out and cast it from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life with one eye, rather than having two eyes to be cast into hellfire. If I remember right, you said that was a, a verse that was instrumental in you getting saved, right? Because of the thought that that picture is just like, whoa. And that was Jesus' point. He wasn't saying, look, you're going to go to hell if you don't pluck out your eye and you continue in sin or something like that. We understand that it's not our works that get us to heaven. It's not uh, repenting of our sins or whatever that gets us to heaven and casting out that, uh, that thing that offends us or whatever. That's not his point. Okay, But his point is that hell's a serious place. And if you had to, in order to uh, be able to go there, if you had to pluck your eye out or cut off your arm, you know, you, you would want to do it. Okay, and I, I always think about that, hike, that hiker that was out in Utah, and uh, maybe you heard it. They made a movie out of it, but I, I never uh, saw that. But I did read the book, 
And in the book, his, I think his last name is Ralston or something like that. And in the book, it talks about how he was out there all by himself. Nobody uh, really knew exactly where he was. And he ended up, this huge boulder shifted, and it fell on his arm. And he's suspended in this, um, this pit with this boulder on his arm. And eventually it starts to, uh, uh, you know, pet, uh, putrefy a little bit. And it's going dead, and the blood's not getting to... Long story short, he takes out his knife which he's been plucking away at the rock trying to free his arm, and he realized that that's not going to work, but he doled his knife in the process, and now he uses that dull knife to literally, excuse me for the graphic, saw his arm off so that he can leave. But he's like, you know, this is my only choice of living, so I either sit here and die or I go ahead and do it. And he did, and of course he had to break his bone, and, and the whole process he describes, it's pretty gory, right? But what he did was his arm offended him, so he cut it off. <laughs> <laughs> and that's quite the picture uh, that, that he's saying here. But look, he's saying, look, if, if your eye offend thee, pluck it out, cast it from thee. It's better for thee to enter into life with one eye than to having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. And I'm not preaching on that first, so I'm not going to get off on that. But we see there that the idea of a fire is consistently used in the Bible about hell. James 3, 6, talking about the tongue. It says a tongue is a fire... A world, a world of iniquity, so is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature and is set on fire of hell. Right? It's saying, it's making that picture that that fire is, you know, uh, the unholy uh, place is, uh, is uh, hell. And of course, he's using some symbolism there, but, uh, but we see hell associated, I mean, fire associated with hell. Luke 16, 23 says, uh, about uh, the rich man and the story of Lazarus and the rich man. It says, and in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and seeing Abraham afar off and Lazarus, Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. So he's in, flame, he's in this flame and it's hot and he's, uh, he's tormented. Now, I don't know to what degree, how bad it is. You know, uh, I've heard a lot of uh, explanations. Um, you know, nothing actually, everything falls short. Every, every illustration, it's kind of like trying to define the Trinity. Every, every illustration falls short. Trying to explain how wonderful heaven will be. We don't know. It, it falls short. You know, you try to teach your kids, heaven's going to be so great, man. It's like you're swimming in chocolate milk and your house is made out of cookies. And, you're, you know, no, no, no. It's going to be way better than that. <laughs> you know? But well, that's just how we try to think about these different pictures and stuff. Well, the same is true. Uh, you know, hell is a place of, okay, I don't know what I was going to say. To use a, a illustration, I remember preachers used to always say, Maybe I go to a youth group or something like that, and they're preaching about hell. And so they would take out a, a match or a lighter or something and, and say, how long can you put your hand on this? And you'd put your hand on that. And oh, as soon as you barely touch it, it's just like too hot, and you take it away. Imagine feeling that for all of eternity. And I'm thinking as a kid, like, well, yeah, I can understand what you're saying. But if I could continue to do that and my hand didn't catch on fire, eventually I would get used to it. <laughs> Right, so, so I don't really understand how it works. All I know is that the soul is tormented for eternity and that the flames are involved. Okay, uh, This is what the Bible says, so there's no reason to try to uh, make it mean something else. But not only is it talk about fire and, ever, and, and torment, but it's everlasting torment. Back in our text there, uh, actually go to chapter 20. This will be where we, where we will be next week, but... Chapter 20, verse 10, uh, talks about when the devil gets thrown into the lake of fire. It says, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Okay? And so uh, sometimes people will try to say, uh, okay, well, the everlasting fire is this place is continually burning or whatever. Uh, maybe they even don't believe it's actual fire, but it's just this, this place. But, but they don't necessarily mean that we experience that torment forever, but they'll, believe, they'll, they'll say what's called annihilation. If you've ever been listening to Jehovah's Witnesses, that's what they teach, that basically God would never allow somebody to be tortured for all eternity. So what really happens is they're thrown into the lake of fire and they just cease to exist. Well, here's a couple problems with that. 
I mean, number one, they're nowhere, you don't see that anywhere in the, in the Bible. Uh, but another thing is, is uh, wouldn't that kind of minimize the scariness of hell? I mean, because look, a lot of people, people that don't believe in God and live however they want, you know what they think happens to them after they die? They just cease to exist, right? So what do they have to fear? And so ultimately you're telling people that, okay, you'll just cease to exist. God will just cast you into the fire and you'll perish and then you'll be gone. You'll never, you'll never exist again. Some people in this world will be like, hey, that ain't so bad. <laughs> That's not the reality of it. The reality is it's forever and ever and ever. You can't just get away by just like, okay, well, he just throw me in the fire. And, I'll... and not to mention how weird that would be. Like there's people that have been in hell for thousands of years waiting for the final day of judgment, which I think I'll get to in a minute. And in the final day of judgment, they stand before God. And these people that have made it all the way up to the end, right? They perish. They, they just perish, cease to exist. And these other people have been waiting in hell for thousands of years. That just doesn't seem right. I mean, uh, uh, you know, I, I suppose you could say it's kind of like the on the opposite end, the story of the guys that get a penny and the ones who uh, came later on in the day. Some of them worked 12 hours, right? And the other ones came like they only worked that last hour. And everybody got paid that same amount, a penny, which would have been like a day's wage, more like probably like 100 bucks or something like that. And uh, I don't even know, it's 100 bucks a day's wage nowadays. But a penny, whatever a penny, would, uh, a day's wage would be today, uh, that would be a, uh, that, a penny in that day. And so the, the analogy was used for heaven, you know, like, hey, those who got saved later on, and a reference could be made uh, between the, the Jews and the, and the Gentiles in the New Testament or something. But, uh, but look, here, they're basically saying that about hell. Like, these people are going to make it all the way up to the very end, just psh, annihilation. Everybody else, and you've got to suffer for thousands and thousands of years, and then annihilation. So one way to get around that, again, Jehovah's Witnesses, I believe, teach, oh, no, they don't suffer in hell for thousands of years. They do what's called soul sleep, which means you literally, like, are just, you don't, you're like sleeping until the great judgment, and then you come up from the grave, okay? And I understand where they get that, but they misinterpret it because our bodies literally, you know, stand before, are, are raised up from the grave. Our bodies are given a glorified body, uh, a different flesh, and stands before God, and then that body is cast into the lake of fire, the final judgment. Uh, anyway, uh, got off track a little bit, but the, but the idea here is that it's everlasting uh, and then the Bible also calls it outer darkness. You say, well, how could a place this be described as the lake of fire also be called darkness? Well, have you ever been in a fire? And I mean, I'm not talking about like actually inside a fire where you're burning or that you probably wouldn't be here. But I'm saying, have you ever been just where there's a lot of fire around you? It's dark all around. You know what I mean? And I imagine the idea of darkness there just basically means, hey, you are, you, it's not like you got friends. You ever heard somebody say, well, if all my friends are in hell, I guess I'll just go to hell and party with them for all eternity. It ain't going to work that way. The person's going to be suffering for all eternity uh, in outer darkness, isolated, napping on their teeth, you know, in pain, where the worm dieth not. And so, uh, so this idea of darkness, uh, and Jesus talked about that in Matthew 8. He said, they'll be cast into outer darkness. And uh, so there's speculation as to where, what exactly that's talking about. But, uh, but we're, we're talking about the eternal torment, eternal judgment. <clears throat> so we looked at the origin. We looked a little bit about the nature of hell. Now, in this passage of Scripture, in chapter 19 and chapter 20, you see an interesting thing, and you don't really see it anywhere else in the Bible uh, clearly. Here it's pretty clear that there's a... There's a differentiation between what it's called here, the bottomless pit, and the lake of fire. These are words that we would use interchangeably for hell, but here uh, there's a difference. And so I want to talk about what the difference is between the bottomless pit and the lake of fire. First of all, let's look at uh, uh, what I'm talking about. Go to Revelation 20. We probably already read this one, but let's go to uh, uh, verse 20. I mean, uh, let me see here. Uh, 19 verse 20 it says the beast that was uh, that was taken I'm sorry yeah and the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him uh, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast 
and them that worshipped his image. They both were cast alive. Remember that, that they were cast alive into a lake of fire uh, with, uh, burning with brimstone. Now, these are cast into the, uh, the, this lake of fire. Look at chapter 20, verse 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city. No, I'm sorry, I'm in chapter 21. Why didn't you stop me? Chapter 20. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on that dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan. Any idea who he's talking about there? I mean, he's pretty specific. And bound him a thousand years. Okay, where was he bound? And cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosened, uh, loosed a little season. And I'll talk about that in the upcoming uh, lessons. But here we see that he's bound for 1,000 years in what's called the bottomless pit. All right. Now, someone might read that for the first time and think, okay, that must be the same place where the beast and the false prophet went. But let's read on. Chapter 7. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. Okay, so that bottom, first of all, and then he's going to be loosened from that one more time. And then we'll go to verse 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. Look at this, where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night. Forever and ever. So I understand the way I understand it is this: he even called it a prison there. So what we would call the bottomless pit, I believe that's the hell that people will go to today. And I'll show that here in a second. Uh, if you if if a person died today without Christ, they would go to hell, which we would also could be called the bottomless pit. All right. And then after the millennial kingdom, there will be a great judgment. And again, some of this is getting ahead to further lessons out there. There'll be a final judgment, and at the end of that judgment, uh, those who have not received Christ, whose names are not written in the book, will be cast into the lake of fire. Now, where's the lake of fire? That's where the beast and the false prophet and Satan are. Okay, So you had the beast and the false prophet were first cast into the lake of fire. The only ones there. Nobody else is there. There are some in the bottomless pit, millions of people in the bottomless pit. Now, the false prophet... Uh, the beast and the false prophet are in the lake of fire, and I'm pointing, but I really don't know how these are separated, okay? Uh, outer darkness, uh, you know, there is a reference in the Bible uh, in the Old Testament where they would cast uh, people outside of the city, and uh, the reference there would be like to outer darkness or whatever. And so uh, somebody could say, you know, heaven, it kind of looks like the temple that God told them to build, and outside of that temple is outer darkness. So Maybe the lake of fire exists in some realm or whatever where heaven is. I really don't know how all this stuff works, like right outside of heaven. I don't know how all this works, but here's the idea. That's not the same place as what I'm getting at as what we now know as the bottomless pit. Now, where the bottomless pit is now, we already had a little bit of insight into that when Jesus said he would spend three days, three nights in the heart of the earth, the center of the earth. Seems like a pretty good place for hell to exist, don't you think? Because it's the center of the earth we know is, is fire, basically, or molten rock. Lava comes up through volcanoes. And, and, uh, and, and I've been told somewhere in Russia, they tried to drill down, see how far they could drill, try to go to the center of the earth. They didn't even get down. I don't remember how many miles it is, but it's like 10 miles to get even past the crust, and they couldn't even uh, accomplish that because uh, it gets too hot, and they don't have any kind of metal that could endure that. And, it, and we know just, you know, uh, scientists have tried to figure out, however they get their measurements, I don't know, but what exactly it looks like, and they say in the center, you know, just this uh, core. I, I have no idea how it looks down there. I don't know, Okay. But I believe it makes sense, and, it, and it, uh, it lines up with Scripture that that bottomless pit is in the center of the earth. Now, another thing I'll speculate and you've probably thought about yourself, is what does it mean by bottomless? You would think uh, in a bottomless pit means you'd never reach the bottom. you just keep falling forever and ever, right? Well, think about this. I, I, again, I don't understand how to differentiate from the spiritual and the physical on this. 
But imagine somebody falling to the center of the earth. Gravity would stop you from actually ending up in China like, they, like the cartoons always show. <laughs> you would just stop in the middle and you would never hit the bottom. So that's something to, to, to consider. Although, like I said, I don't know how the spirit uh, works in that, as far as that's uh, concerned. Now, the, so anyway, there is a difference. And, here, and here's the first, uh, here's what I want to point out, that, that this bottomless pit, I'm going to talk about that first, is more like a jail, okay? Uh, you know, I, okay, but I would think of it more like, in our terms, in our modern vernacular, would be like jail. So you're in a jail, a holding place, uh, and they keep you. There's another word I'm not thinking, I can't think about it right now, but... Uh, correctional facility, I guess, and they'll keep you in that until you face trial, and then whenever you face trial, they'll give you the punishment, and some people's punishment is to go to prison, all right, and so I'll talk about that here uh, in a moment, but let me talk about the bottomless pit. Look at Numbers chapter 16. Numbers chapter 16. In verse 33, we have the story of, uh, of Korah, okay, and the, and the uh, Jude and Second Peter talks about Korah as a false prophet, okay, and the idea is that there are people out there who are what we would call, they've, they've been turned over to a reprobate mind, they've rejected Christ, and they'll do all manners of wickedness, and Korah was the type of false prophet that would rise up. And try to get attention to himself, and and uh, you remember he he told Moses he said you take too much upon yourself, and we're all equally you know uh, spiritual and and basically trying to get a higher position or something like that, uh, but the idea was that he was n certainly not a believer in any way. He was very uh, lifted up with pride, and so here we see in chapter sixteen the end result of the little rebellion that he led. Look at verse thirty three. It says, they and all that appertain to them went down, notice this, alive into the pit, and the earth closed upon them, and they perished from among the congregation. <clears throat> this is the way I read this and interpret it. You can tell me after the service if you have a different understanding of this. But this, and then you compare that with the beast and the false prophet who are thrown alive into uh, in that case, to the lake of fire, right? But they're alive and they're thrown straight into the lake of fire. Here, they're thrown alive right into the bottomless pit. Now, most people aren't going to have that experience. Most people are going to die. Their body's going to be put into the grave. Their soul's going to go to hell. So what do you think happened? It's something I've always, always pictured in my head. What do you think happened if somebody physically, the earth just opened up? God opened up the earth allowed this portal of some sort to go all the way down to the center of the earth, and they just fell into this pit, what do you think would happen to their physical body on the way down? It would just dis it would disintegrate, right? It would, just, it would just cease to exist because on the way down it would just... But then their soul would be there, okay? And so I think that's a way to help in our minds kind of differentiate between the soul and the spirit, like that, that body would disintegrate, and then, it would, and then they would be given some kind of a special body that's eternal, right? I think the same thing happens in the rapture, right? I don't have time to get into the Bible verses about that, but it talks about how we'll be given a different body, a glorified body, right? And so I think the moment that we go to be with the Lord, you know, it happens in the twinkling of an eye uh, so fast, you know, so it's not like you just see all these zombies walking around or something like that. Uh, and I don't believe that you're going to see clothes uh, just all over the place, sitting in the chairs <laughs> and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I won't get into Elijah's mantle and Jesus' folded clothes in the tomb. That's another story. Okay, uh, but my thing is, uh, I'll talk more about it later if you want to, is that on the way up, boom, they would just disintegrate in the, uh, their, their, their bodies. I'm not saying you'd feel pain. It happens so fast. would just disintegrate in the atmosphere. And then their souls given some kind of glorified body. Uh, that's just how I. That's just how I see it in my minds, in my mind. Okay, so uh, so you think about the bottomless pit or hell in the center of the earth, and this is a holding place. It's a jail. 
until the final sentence is carried out. Now, even today in our prison system, which I'm totally against, by the way, <laughs> the way that it the way that it's set up, uh, but even in our system that we have set up, the judgment might be life in prison, and somebody will have to go life in prison. But you know that some people have to go life in the hole, life in, you know, some kind of solitary confinement or life in, you see what I'm saying? Sometimes there are certain crimes or certain people that, that they're going to get worse restrictions than others, right? And some people are going to spend the rest of their life in prison and have somewhat easy life, right? Or some people are going to be kind of like on a house arrest. Now, look, I'm not speculating uh, how much punishment somebody in hell, I assume everybody's tormented for all eternity. That's all I really know. All right. But wouldn't you in your mind at least hope that somebody who's like a child molester or a, uh, uh, you know, just a sociopath, maybe they went on a killing sprees and killed innocent people or whatever. Wouldn't you hope? I mean, there, it would seem more just there. It'd be seem more justified that they would get a worse punishment then somebody who maybe had been deceived into a false religion and they tried to live right, but they, re they rejected the truth, they rejected Christ. Now look, we all deserve to go to hell, all right? We all deserve it. By, only by the grace of God, we can be saved through faith in Jesus Christ. Otherwise, our faith would be hell to some degree. But there are some people who are more wicked than others. You know what I mean? And, uh, and I believe there's, uh, there is uh, evidence in the Bible that there are worst parts of hell okay it talks about uh the lower the lowest hell i don't know uh, how that works i don't think necessarily there's compartments or whatever but the bible talks about that um there's a story in luke 12 we won't go there right now but jesus talks about some uh the it's a parable but he's talking about some that did bad where they would have uh many stripes and some would have few stripes uh, you know, so that's a, a possibility. Don't you hope that the beast and the false prophet are going to get more stripes <laughs> than somebody, you know what I mean, who just, uh, they tried to live a good life, but they were they were deceived, uh, maybe by the false prophet or whatever. Uh, look, they still rejected Christ, and God's still justified to give them eternal punishment. And I don't know how she just kind of hope that there are different levels of hell. Uh, so I don't know. I think there's good... Uh, reason to believe that there is actually okay but eventually all will have their final sentence okay and that is going to include the lake of fire to some degree revelation 20 verse 11 and i saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them and I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which was the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. So you got the book of life, and then you got the books, right? Now, I've heard two different opinions. I heard some people say the books are these, and so you're judged out of the books of the Bible and the laws and the commandments and all that kind of stuff. And I've heard some people say the books are like records of all the bad things that people have done. Uh, I've heard other uh, suggestions, but whatever the case, it doesn't really matter because the ultimate uh, pass that you would get is being in the book of life. Pull out the book of life. It's got everybody's name who's ever accepted Christ is the idea. And if you're in there, you're saved, right? If you're not in there, you're like, no, 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 but I've been a pretty good person. I've tried to live a clean life. I've tried to, uh, I've tried to be nice to my neighbor and stuff like that. These are the, the answers that we get a lot of times when we ask somebody about, uh, about going to heaven. They think that, they, hey, I can get there by my good works. Okay, if you're not in the book of life, you get another chance. We'll judge you out of the books and see. Guess what? Nobody's going to make it. So what does it say right there? Uh, they were according to their works, and the sea gave up, which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. I think hell, there's talking about that bottomless pit, okay? Some people uh, were rose up because they had been in hell, and so they're raised up, and they're, uh, uh, and they're delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every man, according to their works, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. 
Everybody has a first death, but not everybody has a second death. If you're not saved, you have to take part in this second death. If your name's in the book of life and you're saved, you don't have to take part in that second death. Praise the Lord for that. <clears throat> but the cool thing is, and this is my last uh, little thing I want to share, 1 Corinthians 3. 1 Corinthians 3. If you're saved, if you're saved and you die uh, before the millennial kingdom, if you're saved and you go up in the rapture before the millennial kingdom, uh, you know, you will never have to stand at that great white judgment that we talked about because you're already saved. You're already uh, uh, a child of God. And the only fire that you have to fear is the fire that is going to judge your, your works on this earth. Now, this isn't a matter of going to hell. Okay, and I'll read this to you. This is one of my favorite uh, sections in the Bible. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 11 for one, for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And that's salvation. That's salvation. There is no other foundation. It has to be Jesus Christ. It's not like how good you are. Uh, we've talked, just seemed like the other day we were talking to somebody who, who didn't seem to understand that their faith had to be in Christ. It was just like, well, you know, I got to try myself and I got to try to live right and I got to do these things. No, no, no. Your foundation has to be Jesus Christ. If you don't have Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter how good you think that you are. You'll never be good enough. So the foundation is Jesus Christ, okay? If you're saved, praise the Lord, your foundation is Jesus Christ. Uh, but here's what it says. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, those are quite a bit, uh, there's quite a bit of a difference in the component, the qualities of those, uh, those masses there. Uh, you got gold, silver, precious stones. Those are pretty valuable, durable. They would hold up to a fire. Then you have wood, hay, and stubble. That's going to burn right up, isn't it? Okay, and if any man uh, has those things, every man's work will be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work uh, of what sort it is. Now let me just say, he's using this as a picture. So let's say some of your works are comparable to, comparable to uh, uh, gold, silver, precious stones, and some of your works are comparable to wood, hay, and stubble, and it's all in the fire, and what's left, people aren't going to be like, oh, man, look at that wood, hay, and stubble. No, nope, that stuff's gone, right? You know, there's things in this life that you might invest into that don't matter for Christ. Uh, how about your job? have your life those that's important you got to have some stability there uh, you got to have friends maybe that's a might be a good thing to have some friends maybe entertainment maybe there's this hobby you really like I'm not against those I think these are all important things for a person's health stuff but you know what try those by fire they're wood hay and stubble they go up nothing how about the good works that you you did that weren't really for Christ but you just you know you just wanted to do something good for somebody it didn't really mean anything uh, maybe you uh, uh, maybe you fed a homeless person, you know, some food. You say, well, that was a good work, but you didn't share the gospel with them, you know. What, what does that really equal in the end? That homeless person that you fed is still going to die and go to hell if they don't receive Jesus Christ. And so maybe that's a work that was tr when it's tried by fire, it burns up like wood, hay, and stubble. But at the end of the judgment of fire, what's left, the gold silver, precious stones, those are the things that are going to be revealed, okay, as the, the works that you did that are going to glorify the Lord, right, and, they're, and you're going to be rewarded for it. The Bible make, makes it clear that anything that you do on this earth for the Lord and anything that you would sacrifice and give up for Him, He's going to reward you uh, 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 abundantly for those kinds of things. So those are the things that are going to last for all eternity. So let's keep reading. Where do we leave off? Uh, let's go read 13 again. Every man's work shall be manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, most important part, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Okay, 
people that are saved and they're going to heaven simply because they trusted in Jesus Christ. Maybe they still continue to live a life of sin. Maybe they never really did a whole lot for the Lord, never won a soul to Christ, never read their Bible through, never did anything that seems to, uh, to count for anything. But they did put their faith in Jesus Christ. That person's going to heaven. But as, try, as by fire, it's like, hey, man, you got in by the skin of your teeth. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because you got no works to show for it. Now, look, I've heard this before. People say, hey, man, give me the lowest part of heaven. I'll still be happy. Make me the janitor that mops the streets of gold. You know, I'll still be happy. Uh, I don't know if it works that way. But the idea is this. You want, when you get to heaven, for the Lord to be pleased and to say, well done, and to reward you abundantly for the works that you did in this earth, uh, he gets the glory for it, of course, but somehow he rewards us uh, in, in his way. You want to get there with rewards. That's why we do good works. That's why we try to live a clean life. That's why we try to do righteousness. Uh, but none of those things get us saved. Uh, none of those things get us to heaven. But those are the things that we're rewarded for at the very end of the judgment. And I think the Bible's consistent all the way through. And I, I feel like... If a person is just reading the Bible through for the first time and they've kind of pondered on some of these things, maybe. I mean, it's a pretty deep subject. Uh, you gotta, I've heard a lot of preaching on it and I've, I've done some various studies on it or whatever. But I feel like if somebody's reading through, they get to this end, this is where the light bulb goes off, you know, to some degree about, uh, about heaven and hell and then the, uh, the lake of fire at the very end. So anyway, I hope that is a help. I didn't labor on the chapter of, of all these things. And so I wanted to spend some time talking about hell. Let's pray. Father, thank you for our salvation and, uh, and for making a way that we can be saved. Uh, certainly, it would be uh, worth it if we did, if we just were annihilated and ceased to exist. Uh, it would make sense that that's what we deserve. Uh, and quite honestly, according to your righteousness, we, even, we know that we even deserve eternity in hell. But Lord, I thank you that through the righteousness of Jesus Christ, we can come to you and we can be saved. And I thank you for our salvation. And so, Lord, I pray that you just help us uh, to live a life that would cause others uh, to, to see, your, uh, see the good works and glorify you. And that others would come to you, souls would get saved. Uh, help us preach the gospel and and have, live a clean life that would uh, uh, that would help people trust in that and seek seek uh, the gospel and and Lord I pray that you would uh, help us to to do work so that we might get great rewards in heaven uh, not for our honor and glory but for yours that you would be satisfied you'd be happy you'd be glorified because we bear much fruit Lord and I pray that you'll uh, help use this message however you can in our hearts and in our lives and that you'd be praised for it in Jesus' name. Amen.